so welcome to this um, presentation that I called uh, Windows Internals Crash Course. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm the creator and maintainer of the X64 debug project, which is a debugger for Windows. I love doing open source. Uh, so all my work or most of my work that I do in my free time will be available on, on my GitHub if you want to check it out. Um, in the past, I developed uh, obfuscation, virtual machines, that kind of thing. And currently, I'm a security researcher where I'm doing research on deobfuscation and uh, mobile security, basically. So the goal for today is to kind of just show you the basics of, of Windows internals. And I kind of want to give you like a, an overview, like a brief overview, and then kind of the, the, the tools that you will need to, if you want, if you're interested and you want to, to learn more, then I will try to give you those tools to, to find out more. And I will also show like a few demos during the presentation. And I will show like a tool called Process Monitor, which is a kind of famous tool. Now I prefer to have some kind of interaction with the audience. So it's easier to know, you know, <laughs> if something is unclear, if people will ask questions. So please, like, um, during the presentation, if, if something is unclear or, I don't know, you cannot hear me or whatever, just uh, feel free to interrupt and ask. If you ask in the chat, uh, it would be nice if somebody could, uh, maybe Rachid, you could do this, uh, basically say that there is a question because I, you know, yeah, I, I can not see it, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, feel free, to, feel free to ask. So, yeah, uh, let's get started. So the first uh, concept that I, I want to cover, which is kind of uh, probably you're familiar with this, but this is the concept of a process. So a process is a container that uh, separates applications from each other. And I will not go into depth about this, but the, the, there's a data structure in the Windows kernel that's called underscore e process. And this is the kind of the kernel side of a process. So this represents the process in the, in the kernel. And a uh, process basically, uh, well, it's a container. So it, it contains like threads for code that needs to run. Then it contains handles. So this is the, the Windows equivalent of uh, file descriptors on Linux. So, you know, if you have a file or a mutex or maybe another process or thread or pipe, socket, whatever, if you want to interact with those, then you use handles. And then the process has uh, memory, obviously. And inside of this memory, there is also the modules or the shared libraries, uh, DLLs as they're called on Windows, and the executable code is there. So we will start kind of uh, with an overview of the process creation from the kernel side. Uh, I will not go over every detail, but you know, this is kind of the most, uh, the most important things. So the first thing that happens is that uh, the address space of the process is to be initialized. So unlike in Linux on Windows, when you create a process, it actually creates a new uh, process. It doesn't fork from an existing process. So that means that it needs to initialize the address space basically from scratch. Um, so the for one of the first things it does, it maps uh, key user shared data. This is a data like a page that is shared across all processes on the system. And the kernel can basically write something there, and then it will be instantly reflected in uh, other processes. So the kind of things that are there is like the current system time, you know, the frequency of the clocks, that kind of thing. There is the Windows path to the Windows folder is, is also in here. Then uh, the kernel maps the executable file into the memory. And I will go into a bit more detail of what this mapping actually looks like. And it maps ntdll.dll into the process. And this is the kind of the user mode equivalent to the kernel. So this does all the communication with the, with the kernel. And it also does the loading. So this is kind of the LD on Linux equivalent on Windows. So yeah, as I mentioned, there is the mapping of the executables. So on uh, Linux, you have those ELF files. And on Windows, you have uh, PE or portable executable files, which, well, they are not really portable. Other than that, well, they run on multiple architectures, but it's not portable in the same way as POSIX uh, is, for example. Um, and yeah, the important thing is that you have uh, sections there. On an ELF file, this would be the, the segments, although there is some uh, definitely some distinction there. And the sections, they describe like how the memory needs to be uh, mapped into the process. So you have like different uh, page 
uh, protections for different regions. So those sections describe that. Then there are the imports, which is the DLLs that are being used, that are like dependencies of the, of the executable and the functions that need to be imported there. Uh, you have the exports, which is kind of the equivalent. So if a shared library exports some function, then it will be in this, in this export table. And it's also kind of a distinction on Windows, like nothing is exported per default and you have to explicitly export, whereas on Linux, this is the, the other way around. Um, yeah, then, then there's relocations. So, you know, if you want, if you, you have ASLR, so maybe you need to adjust some addresses, there are relocations. And then kind of there's there's a lot more, but the important for us is this address of entry point. So that is where execution will start inside of the executable. And also there's this uh, subsystem, which for example says that this application needs a console or it's a driver or, or it doesn't need any, any kind of uh, console. So yeah, I will just show, quickly show this to, you know, try to not be so abstract. So I have this tool called CFF Explorer, which there are many tools you can use, but this is just one tool that, that I've used for years and that's uh, reliable. So here, yeah, as I mentioned, there are the, the, the sections. Uh, on the left here, you see the section names. They are not actually used for anything, but they are kind, there's kind of a convention with those. So .text, for example, by convention contains the application code and .rdata contains the read-only data, you know, this, this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so as, as I mentioned, there's this, this mapping process. So what that means is that you have a virtual address that is the, there's basically the application base plus the virtual address, that's where this section will be mapped in the memory. And then you have the raw address, which is the offset in the file that, that the mapping will start from. And you have the, the size uh, similarly. And then on the right, you have this characteristics. So if you look here, you can see that, okay, the text section is executable and readable, but not writable, for example, which, yeah, that's good. And if we look, for example, in the R data section, see it's like read only. And there is a data section, which is readable and writable, for example. Then there are the imports that I mentioned. So this test application that I made for this presentation is uh, imports just from two libraries. So there's this test lib DLL. So this is my kind of test library to show, show a DLL file. And uh, it imports a function called my function from there. And then you have kernel 32 DLL, which contains like all of the Windows API. So this application, well, it's compiled to Visual Studio. So it has a bunch of uh, C runtime that needs to be initialized, et cetera. And it uses a bunch of these functions. So I don't know, free library, load library, something related to critical sections, like all kinds of uh, Windows APIs. Right. Then I will show also the equivalent export table. So here is the test library DLL file that I created. And yeah, we, we are importing from there. So we need to have an export in the export directory of this, of this application. And yeah, that's here. You can see that, okay, there's this my function. And then here you see the, the relative virtual address. So the address relative to the base that where this function will actually be. Right. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Are there any questions about, about this part, about the PE? Right. So then we will continue with the process creation on the, on the kernel side. So yeah, as discussed, it basically maps a bunch of stuff in the, in the process memory. And then the next thing it does, it allocates the PEB. The PEB stands for process environment block. And this is a small memory range. I believe it's a one page or maybe two pages uh, that contains uh, a bunch of process specific information. So things like the environment variables of the, of the process are there on windows. You kind of, uh, yeah, it inherits this environment from the previous process and every process contains like those, those variables in some storage. There's the command line. So like to to get to the main, you need to somehow like know like what are the arguments of it. And the command line is also stored in the PEB. The current working directory is stored there. And also stuff like the list of modules that's, that are currently loaded uh, is stored there. 
and like you know some pointers to the process heaps there's there's a bunch of uh, stuff like this um, so after initializing the address space the kernel creates the initial thread or main thread as it's uh, sometimes called and um, well, for a thread, it needs to allocate a stack, obviously, otherwise it wouldn't, wouldn't run. And it needs to also allocate something called the TEB. So this is the thread environment block, I, I will get to it. And then basically after it uh, creates these things, it sets the uh, instruction pointer to this LDR initialized tank, which stands for loader initialized tank, which is the function that will then actually do the dynamic loading and, and all of that. So as I mentioned, there's the thread environment block. This is another small memory range. Uh, currently, I think it's uh, two pages in, in size. And this contains kind of the storage uh, for thread specific information. So it's like a thread equivalent for the PEB. And uh, the kind of things that are stored there, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff there, but there's the thread ID. So the number that identifies the thread is stored in here. There's the range of the, of the stack is stored there. You have uh, on Linux, you have this error number, like the last kind of error that happened. On Windows, you also have this, it's called last error. So this also has to be stored on a per thread basis that's stored there. And uh, you also have uh, thread local storage that's, well, yeah, stored here <laughs> because of this thread local. Um, the way that the TEB is accessed is via the GS register. So the GS register, I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but it uh, works this way that if you access GS, the GS offset X, so the address X from GS, then what will actually happen is that there is this uh, MSR called IA32 kernel GS base, and this gets added to this offset, uh, and then the memory uh, dereference happens. Uh, so yeah, so that's here you can kind of kind of see that. So this is the the start of the thread environment block, that's called thread information block, like it's like a, at the beginning. And like here's, as I mentioned, like the stack base, the stack limits, so that's the range of the stack. There's some other, some other information. And yeah, if you would read GS0, then it would basically add the, the current, the pointer to the thread environment block will be added to zero. So then it will read the exception list. And here you can see the, the other offsets. And this data structure is a self-referential data structure. So at offset 30, there is a there is a pointer called self, and this contains the actual memory address of the te, uh, TEB. And uh, this is uh, useful because, or necessary rather, because you maybe want to pass around the pointer to this structure, uh, and yeah, you need to actually get the real address of it, so it kind of stores this pointer to itself to so that you can conveniently like get the address from without having to do any kernel kernel calls. Because yeah, you can maybe maybe that also helps this, this information. You cannot read this MSR directly from user mode, so that's why the the value needs to be needs to be there. Any questions about this part? All right. So then I will continue just uh, briefly to to mention it. There are different uh, calling conventions on on different platforms. So yeah, on Windows, the calling convention, at least for x64, and I will only be talking about x64 uh, in this in this presentation. But on x64, the parameters are passed uh, in RCX, RDX, R8, R9, and then from there it's on the stack. So on Linux, this is uh, different. I believe it's like RDI, RSI, RDX, or so something like this. Um, so yeah, these are kind of some differences to be aware of. And uh, then you have uh, volatile versus non-volatile registers. And the non-volatile registers are the registers that the caller expects to be unchanged. So if you, if you have a function call, then those non-volatile registers after the function call, they need to be preserved. So they are, well, yeah, they are not, not they cannot be just used as scratch registers and, and yeah, they can be used kind of as a longer term uh, storage and they have volatile registers which are just the registers that you can use you can override them and it's it's uh, no big deal so yeah maybe I will show just briefly the documentation for this 
So if you're interested, you can find a lot of information here on the on MSDN with like all of the registers, if they're volatile or non-volatile and, and their usage, basically what they are used for. There's also explanations here about like different alignment requirements and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, the overall, this is uh, very well documented. Okay, another concept that, uh, that's important for Windows is that you have this uh, DLL main or TLS callbacks. So these are um, kind of similar to this init uh, arrays in the ELF file. These are like set in the PE, uh, in the PE headers. They're basically function pointers that are stored there and they are used as a notification for when a thread starts or ends. So this uh, can be used for initialization purposes, basically if you have some, some globals that need to be initialized, or if you want to use thread local storage and you have want to, for example, I don't know, allocate a cache per thread or something like this, then you have those callbacks that, uh, that you can use for that. Um, there's a bit of a kind of a little bit confusing thing, but you have like differences between uh, DLLs or shared libraries and executable files. Uh, the DLLs, they, they have both DLL main and TLS callbacks, but they basically serve the same uh, purpose for the DLL. So they are both called um, when the when a new thread is, is, is created. But for executables, you don't have, like the entry point is used to just only by the main thread. So you, you have this TLS callbacks uh, as an option to kind of do the thread specific initialization. And this all relates to this uh, loader lock. So in Windows, there's this concept of uh, loader lock. And this is a lock that is held while DLLs are being loaded, while initialization is happening. And uh, it's used to prevent races. So just one example, when this loader lock is held, if you start a thread, this thread will not start execution until the loader lock is released. Uh, so yeah, there's uh, a lot of information also about this on the on the MSDN. So you can see some diagrams, like some best practices, what you can and cannot do while the loader lock is being held. And yeah, just to be clear, so this loader lock is being held during DLL main and TLS callbacks. Uh, so for example, you cannot create a thread and then wait for this thread to finish inside of DLL main because then you would have a deadlock because the thread will never start until the loader lock is released and you're currently holding it. So you will have a, you will have a deadlock. And yeah, I, I just want to mention this because it's it can be a source of confusion for people why they cannot do certain things in certain areas. But yeah, again, if you read the documentation, then there's a lot of uh, stuff explained. Okay, so now I have a, a little demo that I will try to kind of more concretely show uh, all this stuff. Are there any questions so far, by the way, about this? There was one question about the uh, TEB, I believe. Someone yeah. asked if the data structure, I guess, is the same on uh, x86. Yeah, so the, the data itself is roughly the same. There's some minor differences, but it's roughly the same. But yeah, the offsets are, are different because yeah, the pointer size is different. So on 32-bit, I believe the offset is 0x68. I, I'm not sure exactly the offset, but yeah, this is this is different because the structures have different sizes basically on the different platforms. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, all right. So I wanted to show this uh, application. So this is just kind of trying to, I made this application that registers like TLS callbacks, it has DLL main, and it tries to kind of register all of those to kind of show the sequence of, of execution. And yeah, let's start in the main of the test app that exe. So yeah, first it logs, it does some logging, then it calls this my function, and this is imported from the test lib.dll. So we, we saw this before in the, in the PE file. So this my function does something. And then just as an example, like it creates, it creates a thread with uh, some parameter, and then it waits for this thread to, to finish. So yeah, like the, this is, in this case, we can do this because the loader lock is not being held. We are just in normal execution. But if we would do this in the DLL main or the TLS callbacks, then we would, we'd, we would have a hang. So then it logs that, okay, the thread is finished and it just waits for like, yeah, waits to, to press enter. And, uh, and yeah, and then it just exits. And the thread just logs the parameter and sleeps for a bit just to, to show. And then in this test library, we have a function that just kind of uh, 
opens a file and prints the file size just as a test to do something kind of something real, if you will. And also the DLL also has TLS callbacks and it has also DLL main, which is the entry point for DLLs, where it just prints the kind of reason that this callback is executed. So there are, there are four reasons. You have uh, process creation, you have thread creation, then you have when a thread terminates and when the process terminates. So for all of these events, you get a callback, uh, TLS callback and DLL main. Right, so now I'll just execute the application and kind of walk you through everything that happens. So here we have the log. On the left, we see the process ID. So as expected, this always stays the same. And then on the right side, we have the thread ID, which is changing, but we will get to that. And to see the order, we see that the first thing that happens is that our test library, the, the DLL that we have, the TLS callback gets executed. And you can see here the reason is that the process started, process attached, that's the, what that stands for. Then the next thing that happens is that, okay, the DLL main will be called because yeah, as I mentioned, this is kind of the, the same for DLLs, the TLS callbacks and DLL main, they're the same. They're executed right after one another. Uh, and then we get the TLS callback for the test application. And then after this point, the load log is released because all this initialization finished. And then we just get, we see here the main is it being executed. So we get the entry point. Then we had this function that's being executed and we have some example txt file, which is apparently 10 bytes long. So yeah, you can you can see that here, it's, it's 10 bytes long. Mm. Then we create the thread. And then as you can see, the thread ID is changing because yeah, now the thread is running and we are, we are waiting for it. And then again, we get the TLS callback, but in this time we get the thread attach reason. So we know that, okay, that's a new thread. So maybe we want to do some initialization. And again, first we execute the TLS callback of the DLL. Then we execute the uh, TLS call or the DLL main of the DLL. And then we get the TLS callback for the application. And then finally we get the actual thread uh, procedure being executed. So yeah, as you can see, this is the, well, the TLS callbacks obviously have to happen before the thread actually gets executed. And yeah, we just log this parameter 1337 and, and that's it. And then the thread finishes and then we get TLS callbacks and DLL main for the detaching. So here we have detach three times basically. And then, okay, we were back in the main and we finished the, the thread. And now if I will press enter to exit the application, then we see, okay, we get three more TLS callbacks and this time we get for the process detach. So yeah. Um, this is the, the order of, of things that, uh, that's happening. So yeah, just to summarize what we covered so far, we, uh, covered the process creation, PE format, the TEB and PEB, the calling conventions, and then the TLS callbacks. Is there any questions about this? Are the slides uploaded somewhere? Uh, yeah, they will be uploaded, but not right now. Uh, sorry, one second. I will check the questions a bit better. Um, yeah, so I will upload the slides uh, and I will also upload the recording. So if you want to rewatch this, then you can, you, you, can, you can do that, certainly. In the last demo, why is the TLS callback happening twice? Okay, let me just show the last demo. So yeah, so the it's not happening twice. It's the TLS callback first for our DLL file, and then we get the TLS callback for our application. Does that answer the question? Okay. Uh, right. So now basically my ne the next step is that I want, now we saw kind of on a high level, just with logging the order of execution. But now the idea is that we will look at this same uh, file from a different perspective, which is the perspective of a debugger. And just to kind of, um, to better understand what is happening in the debugger, I want to just go over like how a debugger actually works on Windows. So I believe it is quite similar to, to Ptrace. It's just, yeah, I don't know, Windows, <laughs> it's a little bit different. Uh, so the first thing that you need to do as a debugger is that you create the process, obviously, and then you have a special flag that says that, okay, I want to be debugging this, this process, which will do some stuff in the kernel. And then you have an event loop. So basically, yeah, an infinite loop 
where you wait for a debug event. Uh, minus one means that we're waiting forever. And then once a debug event happens, so this uh, can be uh, a bunch of things. So we have like a process creation with trigger a debug event, loading a DLL with trigger a debug event, unloading a DLL with trigger it, creating threads, stopping threads. And if there's some kind of exception, like a full page fold or whatever, then we also get debug events for this. So at this point, like in the middle of the loop, we are basically, the, the process is, is paused and we can do something with this debug event. So I don't know, maybe we want to do some logging, for example, in, I don't know, if a DLL is loaded, it might be good to know, or maybe we want to do some bookkeeping. And then once, you fin once we finish uh, with the event, then we call continue debug event, where we just say, okay, just now we resume execution. And then it goes again and just waits uh, for the next event. So yeah, when, when a debugger is paused, that just basically means that it's it's currently before this continue debug event and it's yeah waiting for the user to, to do something. Um, is this clear how this, how this works? Okay. So now let's go back to the process creation again, just to recap. So as mentioned, we have the address space initialization and then the initial thread is being created. And then we get the uh, instruction pointer is being set to loader initialize thunk and then user mode gets execution. So the loader initialize thunk function uh, has a signature that looks something like this. So it takes uh, two parameters. One of them is the context record. So this is the, the thread context that will, after loading finish it, finishes, this will be the next uh, thread context. And then it has a parameter, which is the enter DLL base, just the base of enter DLL, which yeah, might be useful for it. And uh, so yeah, this loader initialized tank does a bunch of uh, stuff. So it loads the imported DLLs. It handles this loader lock. So it actually creates it and, and, and locks it and all of that. And then it calls the TLS callbacks and DLL main of the executables and, and DLLs. And then once it finishes this, this loading process, I mean, it does a bunch more stuff, but like this is kind of the, the overview. Once it finishes the loading process, then it calls uh, ZW continue, which will resume execution on this function called uh, RTL user thread start. So yeah, uh, ZW continue is a uh, syscall that uh, continues execution of the current thread with a different context. So it will it will pass the context that it got as an argument. It will be passed to ZW continue, and then execution will resume uh, somewhere else. So yeah, now I will uh, show this in the debugger. Uh, so yeah, we open this the same uh, test test app that we saw before. And in case you're not familiar with the with the debugger. I will just kind of briefly show show the, the how it works. So here you have the code, uh, the disassembly listing. On the right side, you have the registers. Here you have the function arguments. Then in the bottom, we have the stack. And then here we have uh, memory view. And there's a bunch more tabs, uh, but uh, yeah. So the first thing you will see if you, if you start is that you will reach here in the bottom, it says system breakpoint reached. But actually, at this point, we already did a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. So what we want to do is go to the options, and then we want to basically check these boxes, which will pass on all of those debug events that I mentioned before. So you want to check pretty much everything except those these two because they're not needed for our purposes. But yeah, this will basically break on every event like thread creation, DLL loading, etc. And then the next thing we want to go to loader initialize tank. And we just uh, set the breakpoint there. And also we will set the breakpoint on this anti continue uh, function that I mentioned. And now if you restart, now we see that, okay, we are in uh, loader initialized tank. And I wanted to also show the uh, memory at this point. So at this point, basically nothing happened yet in the executable. So we would expect there to be almost no memory regions, right? We only expect anti DLL and the executable and maybe a few more few more pages. So yeah, you can check this in the memory map. So here you see there are a bit more things than I mentioned, but yeah, pretty much here we have this KUSER shared data that I mentioned. We have the PEB and TEB for the main thread. We have a stack. 
and here's NTDLL and the test application. And just a useful tool is uh, that's really really uh, really a good tool. It's called System Informer. So this uh, allows you to see a bunch of information about the process. So yeah, this command line and all of that stuff. And here you can also see uh, a bit a different view of the memory. So we can see like a bit more uh, information about what those regions are actually for. So there's this API set map. And if you want to dig into that, there's like a whole rabbit hole uh, there of interesting stuff uh, that you can you can read about. So yeah, I just want to mention this uh, this tool. Also, this tool allows you to show the the handles, all, all that kind of stuff. Okay. So just to recap, we have, we're at the breakpoint in loader initialized tank. We have a breakpoint on anti-continue, so like before we actually start execution of the process, and then we have we break on all of the events that that there are pretty much. So now if we will run then we will kind of start seeing what happens during the loading process. And this is, I highly recommend if you're interested to do this at home, to try to see if you can also like figure out like kind of what happens in the loading. Uh, this is like a really good way to learn about Windows internals. So yeah, we will run. And then in the bottom, you see what actually happens. So there's a, a DLL that was loaded, which is the kernel32.dll. And yeah, this is what we expect pretty much because we imported this, um, yeah. I mean, actually, you don't need to import it for to be loaded, but yeah. Um, and also, if you want, there is a log that also shows all of these events. So if you want to go back and see what happened, then you can uh, also, there's a log. So yeah, okay, we load kernel32 DLL, and then we run again, and then we see, okay, there's this DLL called kernel base, which is being loaded which, I don't know, might be strange at first because that's not imported by us, but actually kernel32 imports this. So like the dependencies, they need to be handled recursively, obviously. So yeah, we, we load the kernel base DLL. And now we start to see some kind of more interesting stuff happening so that now we have a breakpoint on the DLL main of kernel base DLL. So yeah, this will do a bunch of initialization, as I mentioned. So they, I don't know, they have ETW events. You can <laughs> you can spend a lot of time reverse engineering this and trying to figure out uh, what it's doing. But for now, we will just uh, continue. And now, as you noticed, I resumed execution and this console popped up. Uh, and this is this is not a glitch, but um, we, as I mentioned in the PE file, there's this subsystem. And in this case, the subsystem says that, okay, this is a console application. So I can quickly show that here. It says that's a console application. And that means that during the loading, Windows needs to allocate a console for us to, to show. And uh, the console is not hosted by our own process, but there's this separate process called consolehost.exe. And then if we write to the STD out handle, then uh, it will show it on the console. And if we type some input, it will give it to the STD in. So yeah, apparently the kernel base is responsible for initializing this, this console. So yeah, um, now we are at the kernel 32 DLL main. So yeah, as you, as you know, as you notice, maybe notice like the DLL mains, they're executed like from the bottom of the tree up, right? Because first the dependencies need to be initialized and then we can initialize ourselves. So we resume. And now we see, okay, finally our test library DLL is being being loaded. So this is like, yeah, we imported that, so it needs to be loaded into the address space of the of the process. That's what's happening. And now we run, and now we see this uh, system breakpoint reached. So this is what I mentioned before. Like this is the what you would see if you didn't set those breakpoints initially. And this is uh, used basically. A, there's a check in the loader that says, okay, if there's a debugger attached, then we just kind of trigger a breakpoint before we executed any user mode code. So like we just initialize the system stuff and then we give you a breakpoint so that you can maybe, I don't know, the debugger can, can do something, update some, some state and just kind of as an information that, okay, we are now almost at the end of the loading process. But as you maybe noticed, we didn't execute the DLL main or TLS callbacks yet. So if we run again, then we will see, okay, now we get the TLS callback from our test library. So yeah, the kernel and stuff, they don't have TLS callbacks, the kernel DLL, but our test library has a TLS callback. So we, we, we hit that breakpoint. 
And now if we run again, then we can actually start to see those logs that, uh, that I was showing before. So yeah, okay, we had a TLS callback as we saw in the debugger. And currently we are passed at the DLL main of the test library. So yeah, the order of this stuff is also dependent on when they are loaded into the, into the process. So yeah, it executes the DLL main from the test library. And again, we can confirm that, okay, we have our log now, right, after execution. Um, so now we are in the TLS callback of our test application. So yeah, we, we run again. And yeah, okay, we have this. And so yeah, like this is kind of the first stage of the, of the loading. And now we will be in this uh, NT continue function, which will uh, resume the, the execution. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so I will quickly just show um, the the context. So this NT continue has, let's see where the slides. So yeah, it has as the first argument, the context record. And so yeah, we can also inspect this. So if we go to the structure view and then we load this uh, winternals.h file, then we can show the context on at RCX, which is the first parameter. As you can see here, as a hint, the parameters are in green, uh, if, you're, yeah, if you're wondering. So yeah, here, this is the context. And if we scroll down, then we can see, okay, the RAX will be this value, RCX will be this value, etc. And if we look at the rib, and we follow that in the disassembler, uh, let's see. Then we can see that, okay, the next thing, the, the instruction pointer will be at RTL user thread start. So I will set the breakpoint there, and then I will go back to the presentation. Is there any questions so far? And there are no questions, but uh, would it be possible to increase the font a little bit in uh, the debugger? Yeah, sure, I can do that. Uh, I will do Thank that uh, after. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we are now at um, RTL user thread start, and this is when actually the main thread actually starts. So this loader initialized tank is just kind of a to handle the loading of the of the uh, of the, the dependencies of the system, and then we actually have a thread that needs to start. So in our case, we would expect to start at the at the entry point of the executable, and yeah, like here is the execution flow. So we're first in RTL user thread start, then we go to base thread init tank. Uh, which yeah, it basically um, starts executing at this address of entry point in the in the PE file, as I mentioned at the beginning. And this entry point, in case of Visual Studio, it's called main CRT startup, and this stands for main C runtime startup. And the argument there is the PEB that we discussed before. Uh, and then there is a C runtime initialization, which yeah, it, and it does a bunch of initialization, like parses the command line, for example, and then execution is transferred to the main, which is the main that you would, uh, you would expect. So yeah, we'll kind of also show this in the debugger. First, let me increase the font. I don't know, is this big enough? I, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, pretty good. Okay. Uh, right, so... Yeah, right now we are at this call to NT continue, and this will transfer execution to the kernel, and then we will expect to be at um, RTL user thread start. So if we run, then yeah, we see that, okay, we are currently hit the breakpoint at uh, RTL user thread start. And then, yeah, we can see that the arguments, so the arguments are the start routines. So that's the function that will actually, uh, well, the, the thread function basically that will do the do what the thread needs to do, and there is this parameter. So yeah, we can see that the uh, RCX, so the first argument, is at the test app main CRT startup, and the RDX, if you follow that in a memory map, we see okay, that's pointing to the region that contains the PEB and the TEB. So we would just uh, step around a little bit here. Uh, there's some indirections, but yeah, this is the call to base thread init tank. And now we are there, we are at base thread init tank, you can see here in the bottom. Um, and then uh, here we will transfer execution to the to the actual entry point. And the reason that there is this base thread init tank function 
is that we want to be able to return from main. So if we return from main with some exit code, then we want to kind of gracefully uh, close the process. So yeah, this function it um, is used for that. Uh, so yeah, here it calls the entry point, so it's actually a call. And then here you can see that it puts the uh, EAX into the ar first argument, and then it calls this RTL user thread, exit user thread, which will just kind of kill the process basically uh, if this is the main thread. And it will kill the process with the exit code that we actually returned from main. So that's how that works. Another thing is that this function is used as an uh, exception handler. So like if you're, if somewhere in your process you crash, then uh, it will unwind the stack. And eventually if there's nothing handling that exception, it will get here and it will do some uh, exception handling. So, you know, maybe it will do some Windows error reporting or other stuff. Um, yeah, so yeah, if we stop, then we are at the, at the entry point. And now, yeah, we can just kind of run. Um, and yeah, we see that, okay, we have our, our logs that we are expecting and we create a new thread. And then as you can see, once again, it hits this RTL uh, user thread start for the, for the new thread. And again, it hits this loader initialized thunk for the new thread. So yeah, this kind of uh, goes on. And if you're interested, you can, you know, play around with this yourself and uh, get more into it to see, see how stuff works. Right. So yeah, so far we saw the process creation, how it does it in the kernel. Then there's the executable loading that we saw with the loader initialized tank. And basically we kind of now saw what happens, like how the execution goes from the kernel to the user mode. Um, so yeah, if there's any questions, then feel free to, feel free to ask. Uh, but now we will look at kind of like, how does it go from user mode to kernel mode? Because, you know, obviously, in user mode, you cannot do anything, right? You cannot do anything uh, interesting. And uh, this is where you have syscalls. So yeah, this is the same on Windows and, and on Linux. And here's just an example of, uh, of a syscall. So there's this ZW suspend thread. Uh, all the syscalls, syscall functions start with uh, ZW in, in user mode. And yeah, here are the arguments, just an example, the argument. So here you have this handle that I mentioned before. So the, the file descriptor that describes the, the thread that we want to suspend. And then we, I don't know, have some output parameter, which was the previous uh, suspend count for that, uh, for that function. And I will just quickly go over this syscall stops. So in NTDLL, you have those syscall stops. They're just basically responsible to uh, put the syscall number, the right syscall number in there, and then do the syscall instruction. So the first thing this function does, it copies the RCX, which is the first parameter for, for Windows calling convention. It copies that into R10. And this is because the actual Cisco instruction, it clutters RCX. So we need to have a different, put this in a different register. Uh, then it will put the Cisco number into EAX. Then it will do some check for some legacy. So yeah, here, this is the KUser shared data that I mentioned before. So like there are some systems, I mean, you know, super old maybe or whatever that do not support this instruction. So there's also the int2e, which can be used to, to do a syscall, but this is normally not, not, not used. And then it does the actual syscall and then the kernel gets control. It does whatever it needs to do. In this case, suspend the thread and then it will return, uh, return here. And I will just show this in the debugger, just as, as a reference. So yeah, here's the ZW suspend thread. Um, yeah, and unlike Linux, the Cisco numbers of Windows are not stable. So they are uh, different for different Windows uh, releases. So yeah, if you want to get the Cisco number and you want to use the Cisco instruction directly, you would have to extract that somehow from, from this. And here you can see that there's a lot of functions. So all of those have different uh, Cisco numbers. So yeah, that's how the kind of user mode asks the kernel to do something. But also what you want to have is that maybe there is some event that the kernel uh, gets that is interesting for this user mode process. And this is why you have those callbacks. Mm. The callback that we already discussed is this loader initialized tank. So this is used uh, during uh, thread creation or process creation, basically. Then uh, another callback that's uh, kind of important is this KI user exception dispatcher. 
And this is used if there is some kind of uh, page fault or other kind of uh, interrupt or something like this. If the kernel cannot handle this exception, it wants to tell the process that, okay, maybe you want to handle it. So there it has the it has a callback uh, for this. Uh, so yeah, if something happens in the process, then first the kernel gets control and then eventually it will give back control to the user mode process via this, via this callback. Another callback is this KI user callback dispatcher. And this is used by the uh, windowing system that Windows has. So for example, if you click a button or you move your mouse on the, on the window, then the kernel will also inform the process via this uh, callback. And there are, I believe, 26 of these in total that are all have different purposes. And if you're interested, you can check that in this function, uh, PSP initialize system DLLs. So this is in the NTOS kernel.exe. Um, and from there, you can kind of trace those callbacks will be retrieved and they will be stored in certain pointers. And from there, you can trace, you know, where they are used. And if you want, you can debug it or something like this. Yeah, one example of the callback, as I mentioned, is the exception dispatcher. So this happens if there is a seg fault or interrupt. Um, and yeah, this allows the user user process to to handle it. And yeah, this is this is I annotated this with user call because these parameters are not uh, passed in the registers. They don't use a normal calling convention, but instead they are passed on the stack. So there is a bit of uh, assembly magic basically to um, convert that to a regular calling convention. And I just want to show you uh, show you this. So let's take a look. Uh, make the font a bit bigger. Oh, yeah, and I will show the exception ex test application. So I just made a test application that does nothing except write to an invalid address, which is this dead beef. It just tries to write there. So we would expect this to cause a uh, sec fault or access violation, as it's called in Windows. So yeah, first we are at the system breakpoint and hold on. Um, then we reach the, the entry point, And now if we will run again, then Okay, it, it crashes. So here in the bottom, you see that there is a first chance exception on this address. So this is our, you see a move to that beef. And if you look in the logs, you can see a bit more information about the exception. So you can see this exception code, which is used internally. And then you can see, okay, there was a write to this inaccessible address, which is that beef basically here. Uh, so yeah, basically the debugger gets his exception event first, but now if we would run, then control would go to the KI user exception dispatcher. So if we go there, uh, KI user exception dispatcher, and we put a breakpoint, and now we run, then yeah, we get uh, we get control, and now we have to step for a little bit, and at this point the um, parameters are in the right in the right place. So if we go here, we can see the first parameter is the exception record, and the second one is the context. So if you want to inspect this, I uh, have to again load those types. Exception record in RCX. So yeah, this is the, the kernel basically passes this information to the callback to, to like say like what actually happened, why why is this exception happening? So yeah, here you can see uh, this exception code, which stands for access violation. And we can see, for example, the exception address where the exception happened. Uh, yeah. And then the second parameter is the context. So we can also check that out. Context at RDX. And this is the context uh, at the time that the exception happened. So here we can see the rib. Yeah, this is where the where the exception happened. And I don't know, you can see the, the other registers. So yeah, the, the process, like this exception handling is quite complicated and there could be a whole presentation in, in and of itself. But yeah, you can imagine maybe if you have a game that you might want to do some exception report because maybe you want to figure out, like the game developer maybe wants to figure out why the game crashed or, or something like this. And this, this was just to show you um, how you can look at that from the debugger. So yeah, we went over these, uh, these topics. I don't know if anyone has questions or if it's all clear. OK, 
Okay. Then the last thing I will show today is um, process monitor. Uh, and this is a, quite a useful useful tool. Actually, it's also available for Linux now, but it used to be Windows only. And it just gives you a simple uh, graphical user interface that shows the process events. So they are, it's not a debugger, so it doesn't show as many details as a debugger would. It doesn't show exceptions, for example, but it does show like when threads are created, when DLLs are loaded, when files are being accessed. And to do this, it has a kernel component. So it has a kernel driver that uh, uses some mechanisms in the kernel to get notified when there are like when these events happen when and it uses a filter driver for example to to know if there's some file access so yeah i will just i want to show this tool because this is a really a useful tool if you want to understand any anything that happens on windows so if you start a process and you want to see like you know what files is this reading maybe there's an error you want to see why this error happens then i highly recommend uh, trying this tool Okay, let me just close the debugger and uh, okay, I will open process monitor. So yeah, the first thing you would see is uh, something like this. You have a thing and it will just start spamming you with events. So yeah, it happened. It already made like uh, 300,000 events in, in a, while I was talking. And yeah, so as I mentioned, this is for all processes on the whole on the whole system. So yeah, if you're interested, you can check, you know, what, what is Windows doing and you can dig into everything uh, this way. But to start out, we want to make a filter where we say that, okay, we only want to monitor our test app.exe. So yeah, we have here that, yeah, we monitor test app.exe. And yeah, then everything disappears. And also an important thing, if you use this tool, is that um, in the filter menu, you should check this drop filtered events, because if you don't do this, it will still collect events and it will run out of memory. For example, if you run this for 30 minutes, so you, you want to you want to check this to drop all the events that are filtered out, basically. Okay, so now we resume the, the capturing. And now if we will run our test application, then we can see all of the all of the events. So for example, one thing that we would expect is that we know that this reads some example dot text file. And yeah, if you search for that, you can see here that okay, there is a create file that opens this example txt. Then it does some kind of querying of this file. So yeah, it reads the file size and then it it kind of it closes the file again. And what's super useful about uh, process monitor is that Actually, if you click on an event and you go to the properties of the event. Oh, right. I forgot about this. So the one thing that you need to set up is here. You have this thing called configure symbols and there you need to point it to these uh, to these paths. You can find online exactly how to do this, but basically you need to set up the symbol server that it will download the debug symbols from Microsoft uh, automatically. But once you set that up, you can right click on, on here go to properties and then you can well, see the event details, obviously, uh, but you can also see the stack. So actually here we have at first, we have a kernel stack, like a bunch of kernel functions that we don't care too much, but then you can see, okay, there is this empty create file, create file internal, and then this create file A, which I actually called. And then we can see, okay, yeah, it's in our test library DLL, my function plus something, and it even shows the source line if, if that's available. So yeah, this is, uh, quite useful if you want to kind of know you see oh it opens this file but where in the executable is that happening well this is how you can you can find out very easily right uh, so another thing you have here this filter so you can disable a bunch of things so if you only leave this uh, process and thread activity you can see for example all the dlls that are being loaded and all the processes that are are being created All right, uh, so yeah, this was just to show this uh, test application. Another useful thing that I want to show, which is really helpful, is let's reset the filter. Okay, let's clear everything. So imagine that you, for example, want to debug a, uh, a build, like when you're compiling a bunch of uh, applications, maybe there's some error or something is happening. And you basically want to debug not just one process, but you want to see everything that happens. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, let's open a console. 
So what you can do is you just start without any filter, you just start uh, capturing and then you will, as I mentioned, you will get a lot of spam. So what you want to do is just, you have a bunch of spam and then you just right click and you exclude all of those executables. So yeah, this might take a while basically. You want to exclude like everything that um, is just running on the system like per default. Basically you, you're making a baseline. So yeah, I already did this, but yeah, it's just excluding everything. So I already made a filter for this. I can load this baseline filter and this, oh, I forgot to exclude something. This already excludes like all the stuff that's running per default. So if I just capture it, then oh, apparently I didn't exclude everything. Just exclude a bit more. All right. So now we have nothing, nothing that's happening. So for example, now we can run uh, CMake. Oh, something is happening. Yeah, as you can see, there is a bunch of stuff that happens. You might want to exclude. Okay. No. Exclude more. Okay, so we run our build and it doesn't have to be perfect because, you know, you just need to capture not too much spam. All right, so now we finished the capturing the events. So now what you can do, obviously, is you can kind of see what, what happens. And here you can already see some interesting stuff. So actually cmd.exe, when you run CMake, it does a bunch of, does a bunch of searches in your path for different extensions. Uh, so this is something that you can see. And again, if you want to debug CMD, which I don't know why you would want to do that, but maybe you're interested, then you can see here that there is some kind of function in there called search for executable. So maybe you want to investigate that more. Uh, but in our case, we, we just want to see what happened when I actually run this build. And there is another view for this that's called the process tree. This is also very useful. And this takes the current events and kind of shows the processes in a tree. Um, so yeah, here, so here we have our cmd.exe, our root, and then here we see, okay, cmake. And if you want to then, you can go to the event and you see, okay, there's a process start and I can double click on this or go to properties. And then I can see here, I can see, okay, the command line was cmake-b build presentation, which yeah, that's what I ran. There's the current directory there. And also we see, for example, the environment variables, which might be useful when you're compiling and maybe there's some custom, some custom stuff happening there. And yeah, here, I mean, I will not go into everything, but you can kind of see that, okay, there's MS build being executed. There's the compiler being executed. So if we go there, maybe just as, as a quick example, here you see that, okay, apparently it executes from this strange working directory, this huge command line. So yeah, if, if you're debugging something on Windows, this is a very useful, uh, useful tool. And that is pretty much it for my presentation. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank my friends who helped me uh, set, this, uh, set this up. And of course, Tim, who gave me the opportunity to, to speak here today. Any questions? Can you go over the debugging process again? So you mean the debug event loop or what would you like to see the debug event loop? Sure. So the, the way that the debugger works is that you create the process with a special flag and then there is uh, an infinite loop. So an event loop where you wait for an event, the event, you know, the kernel will give you the event once there is something that happens. So for example, a process creation would be an event or a DLL that's being loaded into the process or an exception. And um, yeah, then you can handle this, handle in whatever way you can log it, for example. And uh, then when you're finished with the event, you call this continue debug event function, which will resume the execution. So the question is, so from the process, it would be possible to check whether the process was created with this flag and know whether it's currently debugged. Uh, so yeah, you, you can, there are ways to, to detect if the debugger uh, is attached to the process, yes. So there is a function, for example, it's called um, 
Let me just show you because it will be easier. Uh, let's see. So there is a function called is debugger present, um, which uh, what the hell just happened? Oh, hold up. Ah, yeah, because it's not loaded yet. One second, okay. Yeah. So this is a function that's in kernel base called is debugger present, and this um, this is a flag. So there's a flag being stored in the PEB, for example. So yeah, here it gets the address of the PEB. I can actually I can actually show this one second. Um, I have my header and I can show you the PEP. So inside of the process environment block, I'm sorry, but I cannot increase the font very easily here. No, there is a flag called being debugged. Um, so yeah, and as you can see, the value actually in this case is one. So yeah, there is uh, information about whether the process is being debugged and there are definitely if you if you're interested there are a lot of anti-debug techniques so ways to detect the debugger but there are also ways to hide the debugger so yeah does that answer your question all right anything else Okay, then, uh, well, thanks very much. I will uh, forward the slides and, and the source code and all of that stuff for the what I showed you, I will forward it to Tim and I guess he will make it available somehow. Uh, and there will be a recording on, on YouTube probably at some point as well, if you want to rewatch it and, and follow along. All right, thanks very much. All right, thank you again, Duncan, for presenting and giving us this talk. Sure. Uh, yeah, as mentioned, the slides will be uploaded as soon as possible on Moodle and uh, yeah, probably on YouTube, unlisted, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. All, All right, right, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. And yeah, goodbye. Bye-bye.